And now, Lifestyles Unlimited presents the Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Over the next hour, we unfold your map to financial freedom. You'll learn how to retire through investing in single family and multifamily real estate. You'll learn how to create cash flow and build wealth so you can have the time and money to live the lifestyle you want. Hello and welcome to the show. This is Andy Webb with Lifestyles Unlimited. And as always, we're working on your financial freedom. And I thank you for tuning in today. Um, we're going to talk today about credit and credit scores. This is a real estate investor radio show. So how does how does credit impact us as investors? And if you have any questions after today's discussion, uh, send an email my way to askandy at l-u-i-n-c dot com. Again, askandy at l-u-inc dot com. So how does credit impact us as investors? And Let's not just look at ourselves. Let's take a look at how we are doing from the credit perspective as a nation. I have some bad news for you, actually. As a nation, we are increasingly turning more and more to credit card use to, to manage our daily expenses. And, and actually, it's not just credit cards. It's, it's debt in, in, in general. A much now, this isn't even really debt, but a much higher number of people are now dipping into their 401ks and taking hardship withdrawals. These are not loans. These are out, outright withdrawals in order to cover their, their, those daily expenses. And if you're concerned that you could land in this camp one day and be one of these people taking on more and more debt, drawing down your 401k sooner than you anticipated, way ahead of retirement, well, you, you can do something about it right now. And, and, and what I'm thinking about here is just, just invest in a few single-family rental houses. That's what we talk about on this program. You can create the additional income in your life, passive income, by the way, so that you don't have to rely on that ever higher credit card debt. For example, if you buy one single-family rental, you can add an additional $200 to $500 per month in extra income. That's, that's the net profit that we keep every month on one single-family house. It varies by location and property, obviously. And it may not sound like a lot, but you then realize through the process how easy it is to buy that one house and how easy it is to own and manage rental houses. So you go out and buy another and that income number doubles and you buy another. And now you're you're north of a thousand dollars per month and soon that doubles to two thousand. And so it goes onward and upward. Now, does that sound like a good income cushion rather than the credit card or that hardship withdrawal? Well, for this process, for what we do, and the way that we buy as investors, at least following the Lifestyles Unlimited model, we do use other people's money and we use financing. Credit credit is very, very important to us. So let's take a look quickly, uh, see what's going on nationally. I want you to understand this picture and then let's bring it back to you and to me and to investing. I'm going to start. I've got a couple of articles here. Uh, the first of which, there, there are a number that came out just recently. Uh, this one was on CNBC. but. Uh, you can find these out there because credit scores have decreased. This is the article title, title, Credit Scores Decrease for the First Time in a Decade as More Borrowers Fall Behind on Payments. So the national average credit score fell. It declined for the first time in, in a decade or so. Now it only fell to 717. That's the average nationally. Still sounds like it's in a good ballpark area, but as a, a, someone is quoted here in the article, it is, this is Ethan Dorhel, Dorhelm, he's FICO, right, that's the credit score uh, company, he's the vice president, and he says it's a notable milestone, this is the first time in well over a decade that scores have gone down, a notable milestone, it's a signal, yeah, it, it went down just a degree, it went down from 718 to 717, but it's a sign of what's happening out there. The average credit card utilization was 35%, that's up from 33%, that means if you have a credit line of of a ten thousand dollars you're using thirty five hundred of that at this point it was thirty three hundred right you're getting you're getting it into more dangerous territory with that and the share of borrowers that have gone past a thirty day uh, payment uh, missed payment is higher so we're seeing credit scores declining we're seeing credit usage go up we're seeing the use of credit uh, responsibly as becoming a problem you know, he says here in the article, uh, average nationwide credit scores bottomed out 
at 686 during the housing crisis about a decade plus ago. And then there were quite, it just went up steadily. In fact, if you go to Business Insider on their personal finance page, there's a, an interesting uh, average credit score by year. Now, this is national, um, but it has steadily ticked up year by year. 2013, it was at 691. 2014, 692. These are small increases, right? 2015, 695. 708 in 2020. COVID hits. Government starts doling out money, and we see a big jump, 716. And we peaked, like I said, at uh, 718 in 2023. And now a decline. Why a decline? Well, higher interest rates and higher prices that inflation that we we heard is still there it's sticky they're they're weighing on our on our purchasing power and we are falling deeper and deeper in debt so that's part of the equation we i mentioned briefly in there the covid the the stimulus checks we got that drove up our savings cushion for a period but that's trended back down to zero <laughs> so savings are uh, basically gone so this is just one indicator of what's going on out there another article i, I pulled up this came out mid-march uh, this is on Fox Business, but there, you'll, you'll find a slew of articles around this out there, there as well because 401k hardship withdrawals, they surge. And this, again, seems like a small number, but it is a very big jump. And I do wonder if the canary's starting to chirp or has passed out altogether, I suppose, rather, um, are those foreclosures coming? Is that higher credit usage, that lower credit score, those hardship withdrawals going up, uh, is that a sign of things to come if it is? You need to be ready. You need to be ready to get out there and buy those houses at a discount. If that comes, if that comes, I don't know. People were expecting something down the pike a year ago, two years ago. The market, the housing market has just uh, continued to march on. And it's interesting in this hardship article, 401k hardship article, they talk about credit card debt as well and that it has surged. We've heard this in, in December of, of, of the prior year. Uh, it hit an all-time high, $1.13 trillion highest level on record so we're clearly we're clearly moving in that direction and the question is is there something you can do about it so that you're not one of those in the camp that's having to do these to take these these actions and 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 the solution that I'm focused on of course is real estate if you're worried about confronting a situation like we've described in those articles increasingly taking on credit card debt 401k withdrawal something else what is the solution you simply need more you need more income more income if you're having to turn to debt it's pointing to a lack of savings and a lack of income and we can increase that income the best way to do that is through real estate investing because this is passive income. You're working, you can continue to work while you add more and more passive income to your portfolio. Why real estate? Why residential? That's what we're focused on, single family and apartments. Look, people are always going to need a place to live. We just heard a higher and an increased use of uh, 401k hardship withdrawals to avoid foreclosure. People want to stay where they live. They need a place to be. So this asset class, it's, it's, it's not going to go away. It will always be in demand but for you to create that backstop that financial backstop you need to create more income and that's where real estate steps in and I mentioned earlier in the show that buying one single family house just one can add anywhere from two to five hundred dollars a month in net income net profit to your to your monthly uh, household income and you add more and you add more after that but it's not just the cash flow one of the reasons we like houses and apartments as investments is because they create money multiple ways cash flow in this situation in this conversation is important to us but there are lots of equity plays because when we buy we buy right we're buying distressed assets typically and buying at a discount and we create equity capture that's a big equity bump that I get at the start it can be it can be a 100% return immediate doubling of my money but then we're holding these assets over a period of time and we watch as the equity grows through market appreciation as well as equity buildup because my residents are paying that mortgage on my behalf. They're paying that on my behalf. So it's going to grow over time, my equity position there. And there are tax advantages as well. We talked about that on prior shows. But cash flow is important here. Cash flow is important. This is what will help you address these situations where you feel you have to turn to a credit card if you have more income coming in. But if you're not sure how to do that, well, that's where we step in. That's where Lifestyles Unlimited steps in. We teach you how to buy, renovate, finance, right? That's the topic today, rent and manage those single family rentals. It's, it's not rocket science. And I think once you buy one, you'll see, wow, Andy was right. This is a lot easier than I thought it would be. But sometimes it seems daunting. It seems scary. And sometimes you need somebody to just lay it out for you. That's what we do. And we do that across many, many different events. Um, we have case studies live and in person. You can attend those online. We have a lot of, I, I did a lunch and learn, in fact, just yesterday uh, from home. 
Uh, there's our two-day financial freedom seminar, big, big one, actually, because you go out on day one and learn all about buying single family, all the things that we talk about to create that cash flow. And then on day two, we talk about apartments. In fact, I went to the two-day a couple of months ago and finally got my wife to go back out. I said, look, I'm going to watch the, the our son. Don't worry about it. I got him for two days. I can handle this. So she went out to the two-day. Boy, she came back. She came back fired up. She came back really fired up. You know, she, she learned a number of things, reviewed and remembered a lot of things. It's been a while since she's been, and um, we've got a lot of plans now. <laughs> we took those goals, and we're going to broaden those. But there are a lot of opportunities uh, within lifestyles to learn and to help you grow and to help you become comfortable doing the things that we, that we talk about. But to bring it back to credit, um, we do follow a specific model, and they talked about this at the two-day. We're going to go out, and we're going to find that distressed house. It needs work, and we want it that way because we're going to go in and we're going to fix everything that is broken now or could break in a handful of years and make it shine again and put it on the market for lease at the best price, best product, best price. We're going to get the best people in that house, and we're going to hold on to that for a number of years, like I said. We're going to refinance into long-term debt, um, and we're going to sit on that. So because we're using debt, if you're following the Lifestyles Unlimited model, you're, you're buying single families with, uh, with, fa with financing. So you need to keep an eye on your credit. Credit is absolutely important. Now, why not all cash? Some people out there say, well, wouldn't it be safer? Look, you lower your returns when you buy all cash. And quite frankly, quite from the practical perspective, most people don't have the money on hand to go out and buy one, let alone mul multiple houses, all cash. And you shouldn't. You shouldn't. We've done shows where we talk about the advantages of using hard money, that's our, our bridge lending, to then get into conventional debt through the process. But long story short, I can have $20,000 into one single family house investment when I finance it rather than 150 or 200. So clearly you can buy more. But better credit is something we have to focus on. Credit means loan approval. Credit score, a better credit score means a better interest rate. A better interest rate means higher cash flow and that's really our focus for today's show in order to get you past that credit card debt to get you past those 401k hardship withdrawals and to get you growing and we're going to talk in the second part of the show about credit scores what affects that credit score how can you improve that how do you keep an eye on that as an investor so we will be right back Got questions? Call Lifestyles Unlimited at 855-497-4335. The Real Estate Investor Radio Show continues next. Lifestyles Unlimited member Lisa on how our educators and mentors share their knowledge. The whole Lifestyles Unlimited team is just wonderful and all the people in it is basically copying what I do so you could be successful. Lifestyles Unlimited, over 33 years teaching the real estate retirement roadmap. Go to GiveMeTotalFreedom.com. Give me total freedom. Enter code 2024. Join the financial freedom program for just $297 for two years. That's GiveMeTotalFreedom.com code 2024. Creating the lifestyle you've always wanted. You're hearing Lifestyles Unlimited's Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Andy Webb. I thank you for joining me today. If you have any questions, send those my way. You can email me at askandy at l-u-i-n-c dot com again ask andy at lu inc dot com that is andy on the other end of the email answering your questions so i'm happy to help you where i can now we're talking today about credit credit and credit scores um first part of the show we looked at um the fact that credit card usage is increasing right makes sense inflation is still there um, but i think more importantly is the fact that the f average fico credit score across the nation has actually declined for the first time in over a decade of, of increases. Now the decline, right, we went from an average across the nation of 718 to 717 does not sound like a lot, but it is a move in the wrong direction. And I think that's an indicator, just, an, just another of many indicators, in fact, of what's going on um, across our nation at the moment. So let's focus now on the credit score portion of this discussion. And it's interesting I mentioned a website earlier, Business Insider. They've got a personal finance page, and they talk about credit scores and whatnot there. They've got all those annual averages I was looking at with you. Um, if I look by age, Gen Z, millennials, the lower, you know, the younger cohorts, they're at 680 and 690 on average. This is 2023 numbers. 
my my gen generation Gen X we're at 709 on average across the nation baby boomers much better 745 silent generation right 77 and up 760 makes sense when you're younger you don't have as much of a credit history so you will naturally have a lower credit score you may not have any credit at all something to work on also interesting they give the average credit score by state we heard that the national average 717 last year Texas where do we sit Ooh, we're below 700 695 <laughs> a little on the low side uh, lots of states are higher it seems they, they have a footnote here that uh, the southern belt seems to have the lower uh, trace tracking a little lower on the on the credit scores lower than other regions of the country but what is a good credit score maybe that's a good question why don't why don't we start there and and to start there I'm actually gonna flip over to our single family timeline checklist this is a multi-page checklist that we use at lifestyles unlimited if you're a single family investor this helps you make sure you're staying on track and on target as you're working through the process from the very beginning when you haven't even bought a house you're just figuring this thing out helping you determine your goals that that sort of thing helping you build your team who do I need to be looking for and so on but there's a section in here regarding lending and you know figure out your strategy you know are you buying with hard money can conventional what are you doing get lender pre-approval and it's at this part in the process that you're going to start to figure out just what is my credit score I know you probably have credit cards that give you a mock-up of that credit score it's not precisely the FICO score that lenders are going to be pulling when you start to buy and, and borrow for for houses but what is a good credit score well right here right here checkbox it says keep your credit score above 740 and I recently did a, a cash out refinance using a, a commercial product called a debt service coverage ratio loan it doesn't really look at me personally it looks at the property but they do pull your credit and I had the conversation with the uh, loan officer there 740 exactly what he said as long as you're coming in ab above that Andy you're you're fine now they say the minimum minimum is 680 but you should be shooting for the higher end shoot for for 800 it goes on by the way in this checklist keep your credit card balances below 30 percent of what you have on hand at that card we read in the credit card saw in the credit card uh, usage article that people are now at 35 percent so they're getting above that preferred usage threshold you want to make sure you're staying below that and by the way keep your debt to income ratio below 45 percent all of these things when you go through that pre-approval process you're, you're gonna have that conversation with the lender they'll be able to help you figure out uh, where you sit with these with these uh, various metrics but we're going in the wrong direction and you can do things to make sure that you are not on the coattails of everybody else going in that direction and we do that by buying and investing in real estate creating passive income adding extra income to our monthly household one house two hundred to five hundred dollars double that double it again and before you know it you're bringing in two thousand three thousand five thousand ten thousand dollars a month in passive income I'm there I've done this I'm telling you you can do it too but there are a lot of tools in your toolbox and your credit score is one of those things that will help you because we do finance financing taking on debt when we buy these things lets us go a lot farther in our in our buying uh, phase and speaking of buying phase we talked in the prior segment about the FICO score what comprises that and if you want to learn more you can go to myfico.com uh, they lay that out there for you it's good to know it's good to think about this and keep an eye on it but then as you're buying rental property you're, you're inherently adding debt to your debt profile and, and, and I mentioned one of those components of the FICO score is the new is the new credit right you've taken on new debt it's only 10 percent but if you're taking on a lot of debt that can push your your credit score down how do you handle that well, you could be a little bit slower in your purchases I don't know that that's the best way to go I don't know that that's the best way to go but if you're like my wife and I married couple both had jobs at the time both working and your debt to income ratio supports doing this remember on the single family timeline checklist I mentioned uh, lifestyle says hey keep your debt to income ratio below 45 percent mortgage lenders might say 50 you know have that conversation with your lender but the lower the better but if your debt to income supports and your spouse's debt to income supports buying houses separately you should do that and this does two things number one you buy the house the first rental house right you, it takes a takes a little bit of time to renovate it so that you can then do the refinance into the longer term debt find the residence in the meantime you're looking for the second house but you don't buy it it goes into your spouse's name same thing process takes a little bit of time then you're ready for your third house you just alternate back and forth this is going to increase the time before between credit hits on your 
on your reports, exactly what my wife and I did, and, and our credit scores remained relatively high throughout. The other thing, the other advantage to this process if you are married uh, or have a significant other is that Fannie Mae, again, that's the cheap government-sponsored debt that we like to put on our houses. They'll let you do up to 10 mortgages in your own name. So a lot of people think community property state Texas got to have husband and wife both on the deed and on the loan. You do not. You do not. So my wife and I, we followed this. Put my personal house in my name, took the debt in my name, then she went out and bought our first rental house. Debt is fully in her name. I went out and bought the next one. Debt is fully in my name. She went out and bought the next one. And we rotated like this, and over time, credit scores stayed up, but we were also able to maximize the number of Fannie Mae loans that we added to our portfolio. You can do 10 each. If you're both on the debt together, maximum 10. If you can split that up, maximum 20. Helps you go a little bit farther. And thinking about your credit score as you're in the buying process and you're a couple, think about this from the credit cards per perspective as well. Actually, our strategy shifted when we realized how much my, my wife hated her job and how badly she needed to get out of there. We wanted to buy as many houses under her name as we could while we could, while she had the income. So we shifted tactics. And as far as credit cards go, I added credit cards purely in my name so that as we used those, we stopped using our shared cards as much. And as we added credit to the credit card um, for gas, for whatever, it was solely going against my, my debt load. Again, keeps her credit score higher, keeps her debt to income higher, keeps her credit profile looking a lot better. When I lost my access to Fannie Mae because I retired from corporate America, no longer had a W-2, same thing. So think about that as you're going through this process, if you have a significant other and you can divide and conquer, maybe that's the time to do it. And it's very easy, like I mentioned, to increase those credit lines. Uh, just make sure they're not doing a hard credit pull as part of that, that request. And when you do, you know, I mentioned I just did a debt service coverage ratio refinance, a DSCR loan. And I always make sure when I'm, I'm through the process and we've closed and I've paid the lender that I ask for those credit reports because I want to see what's on there. I want to know what the actual FICO scores are. Which of the three did they use? Why is there a 50-point spread between the highest and the lowest, right? You get this information in real time when that lender gives you those reports. So be sure to ask for it. You paid for it. <laughs> After all, you paid for it. So just some thoughts on ways to keep your credit score higher as you start to go down this down this road of buying houses. Now, if your credit score is bad right now, if it's below that 680 minimum, if it's below that 740, if it's below that even better 800, well, that's something to work on. That's something to set a goal around. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't start getting educated because there are other ways to uh, to invest. If you're an apartment investor, I invest passively in apartments. My credit score has nothing to do with it. The syndicator does not care if I have a 200, a 500, or an 800. So if that's your concern, you might consider investing passively in apartments. We create cash flow. We create equity through that as well. And by the way, thinking about those declining credit scores... You know, it's not just something to think about for us when we, you know, when we buy that house. It could, it could have an impact when we sell. Think about this. If fewer buyers are able to obtain credit because their credit scores are in the basement, could that be an issue? Sure, sure, it could, it could. But I think more importantly, think about this. We're buying these houses to hold for a period of time and to lease out to great residents. Does a downward shift in credit scores from that perspective, have any impact on me as an investor? Well, it might. It might. There are three things. There are three things to having success in, in, in real estate. It's buying the right asset and fixing it up right. We call that best product. It's having the right team around you to help you with everything you do in this space. But the third leg there is right, having the right residence, right? Best product, best price is going to yield the best people. And if people are having trouble with their bills, if credit scores are decreasing and people are increasingly taking hardship withdrawals from their 401ks, how does that impact us as rental owners? So let's shift a little bit because it's not just about our credit scores as investors. When we get that house renovated and we're ready to lease it out, we're going to put it in the market. You may you may do this on your own. You may, you may use a leasing agent or a realtor or something like that. In fact, the 
the single family timeline checklist that I mentioned has got two columns within the checklist for me to follow the steps, whether I'm doing it myself or with help. But at some point, I'm going to start to get applications in and I'm going to need to review these. I may have my own rental portfolio like I do. You may as well. Well, this is generally a topic for this time of year anyhow, because we're going to offer renewals to our existing residents and some may move out. Some may move out. And as these economic issues come to into greater focus, I need to be able to greater focus on my processes and I need to have very, very strong screening criteria. And common criteria, I'm leading to the credit score here, common criteria when it comes to a rental property and renting a house to somebody, usually we're asking for three times the rent in, in gross income, pre-tax income. Usually we say, hey, no, in, no, no evictions, no, no recent foreclosures, maybe. I did rent a house to a family that had had a recent foreclosure at the end of the last financial crisis. They were some of my best residents. They stayed around forever. <laughs> they had great jobs, great income, just had some issues at that time of the season of their life. But uh, you, may, you may have that as a requirement, minimum credit score. And this is where, it was, where I want to get to. This varies greatly. I looked at some of the leasing, uh, some of the houses for lease in mine, just in my city here uh, prior to the show. I saw one listing where they had the credit requirements in the in the listing minimum score 600 I saw another one minimum score 550 I saw one minimum score 700 I saw one minimum score 750 very high very high probably said no pets that that investor is going to have a harder time leasing that property. Keep in mind that as more and more people run into issues financially, your 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 applicants may become less and less stellar. So how are you going to handle that? This is something to think about. Is it lowering that credit score portion of the criteria? Again, I saw somebody that had a minimum in the 500s. Well, that's an option. Is it increasing your security deposit requirement? Look, if everything else checks out, except for the credit, and it's in the basement, a little below at below your, your ideal threshold. Well, maybe it's increasing that security deposit. You know, I talked to an investor years ago, invests in a rougher uh, part of town. He doesn't look at credit at all. He said, Andy, if I, if, I, if, I, if I had a minimum credit, I wouldn't get these houses leased, period. So there are lots of ways to approach this. We talk about these things at Lifestyles Unlimited. But give that some thought, because as we head into rougher economic times, you need to think about these things as, an, as, a, as a rental owner. These are things we talk about at Lifestyles, by the way. And speaking of lifestyles, if you're concerned about the economy, inflation, your credit, your retirement, it do doesn't matter what it is. If you need to create more income, passive income, real estate is the way to go. Lifestyles is here to help you. We'll, we'll talk about these things, like I said, around screening, how things in the market are going right now and whatnot, but we'll help you on your way. We are here to help you. Go to lifestylesunlimited.com. I want you to start by just signing up for our free workshop and learning more about what we do and how we can get that ball rolling for you. So take some action. Remember, it's not the money, it's the lifestyle. The information and opinions you hear on the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show are those of the hosts, guests, and callers. The Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented constitutes an endorsement, recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.